In this segment, we're going to take a look at what happened as the world went to war and erupted again. We often associate World War II with four faces of aggression. We think of Benito Mussolini, who has established fascist Italy. We think of Adolf Hitler, who established Nazi Germany. We think of Hideki Tojo, the prime minister who was an imperialist in Japan, and Joseph Stalin, the communist dictator of the Soviet Union. While each of these rose to power in different places, they pretty much followed the same common themes, including holding power by force and fear. Each of these dictators forbid political competition. They appealed to their nation's pride and prejudices. And each nation was suffering hard economic times at the end of World War I and wanted to grow out of their own global depressions. As we watch this slide, we want to consider how did the United States respond to the increasing totalitarian aggression in Europe and in Asia as World War II began? And also, what caused America's gradual abandonment of the policy of neutrality? America attempted neutrality as militarism was sweeping across Europe. As you can see in this Dr. Seuss cartoon, where the old family bathtub is plenty safe for me, Seuss is making a comment that while we here in America think we are safe in the American or Western Hemisphere, the bathtub is full of aggressors. America responded to increasing tensions with the Neutrality Acts of 1935, where we declared it would be illegal for the United States to assist any belligerent nation. America first became the catchphrase of the time. That is, let's look out for America first. After all, this is the 1930s. We have problems of our own. The war began in September of 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland. At the same time, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the opposite end. Now, we knew that the Nazis and the communists were staunch enemies. However, as those armies came to meet, they stopped. They would not engage in each other. Well, later we came to find out that Hitler and Stalin had signed this thing called the Non-Aggression Pact. Before the war even broke out, they had secretly met and decided that they would not square off and fight each other. Hitler had bigger plans. He knew that eventually he wanted to take on Joseph Stalin. Stalin was no idiot. He knew that eventually Hitler wanted a piece of him. But Stalin was not quite ready for war. And so therefore, as Hitler moves in, Stalin moves into Poland, and establishes the buffer zone and buys time. Well, as soon as Germany invaded Poland, even though the Nazis had made transgression after transgression against the Treaty of Versailles, this was ultimately the last straw. France and Great Britain quickly declared war on Germany. Well, Germany in turn declared war on France and Great Britain, which brought Italy into the conflict, and then France and Great Britain declared war on Italy as well, and then a bunch of other guys jumped in. Hey, we're back to another world war. But it seemed like nothing was happening. As the months moved on, Hitler went into action. The United States held on to the idea that we are going to stay neutral and stay as neutral as we possibly can. Germany quickly overran France, Belgium, and many other states and countries in Europe. Germany pounded Great Britain from the air in what came to be known as the Great Battle of Britain, where 
bombardment after bombardment occurred in cities all across Great Britain. It seemed that the British didn't stand a chance alone on an island, and France had already given in and, and, and surrendered. Well, Britain pretty much stood alone against the Nazi force. But it was amazing the resilience of the British people who found refuge in the sewers, but more importantly, the subways across London. And they managed to hang on and survive. By mid-1941, Hitler became very frustrated. He was not strangling Britain like he had hoped, and they were not conceding to his air raids. In fact, Hitler was losing quite a few bombers during this time. And that's when Hitler decided to move his plan ahead anyway. And by mid-1941, Hitler turned on what seemed to be his former partner. He invades the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, America is still debating. Should we get involved? Shouldn't we get involved? We got involved before, but is now the right time? After all, we still have this Great Depression going on. The United States slowly, again like World War I, slowly abandoned neutrality as events in Europe and Asia pulled us into war. When it comes to the war in Europe, despite the strong isolationist sentiment here at home, the United States increasingly began to help Britain. We gave Britain war supplies, old naval ships, in return for naval bases in Bermuda and the Caribbean. It was what we called the Lend-Lease Act. Uh, uh, we will loan you something in exchange, and, and we offered this, but slowly, the Lend-Lease Act gave the president the authority to sell or lend equipment to countries to defend themselves against the Axis aggressors with payment to be made later on. Franklin Roosevelt compared this to lending a garden hose to a neighbor whose house is on fire. In a fireside chat, Roosevelt explained that if you hear a knock on the door in the middle of the night and it's your neighbor who needs a hose to put out the fire, you don't ask him for payment right then. You don't ask, how is this going to be returned to me? How long can I expect it to be borrowed? What if the hose is damaged? You help your neighbor. And in this case, Roosevelt said, we need to help Great Britain. And while most Americans were focused on the events that were going on in Europe and arguing back and forth, should we loan stuff? Should we stay with cash and carry? What should we do? It was really going to be the war in Asia that draws us directly into this conflict. The war in Asia had been going on for quite a while. The militaristic Japan had invaded and brutalized Manchuria in the early 1930s. It also invaded and brutalized China as it sought military and economic domination over Asia. The United States refused to recognize these gains. We declared that they were simply not right, that Japan had no business being an aggressor nation. We even embargoed our exports to Japan, our scrap metal, our iron, steel, and oil. We said, we're gonna cut you off until you get out of those areas and play nice. Every time Japan seemed to refuse, we would negotiate. And time after time after time, for five or six years, we always seemed to find a way to find peace. However, all of that changes on December 7th, 1941. In the midst of negotiating with us, and without any warning whatsoever, Japan carried out an air attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, again, December 7th, 1941. The surprise attack was incredibly successful. It destroyed most of the American Pacific Fleet, killed several thousand Americans, and was the deadliest attack on American soil until September 11th. Isolation was never going to happen again. On December 8th, 1941, the Monday 
following the attack on Pearl Harbor. The president called a special session of Congress. Roosevelt declared the attack on Pearl Harbor a date that will live in infamy. And he asked Congress to declare war on Japan, which they did resoundingly. As Dr. Seuss points out, this is the end of a nap. The United States is now awakened from its isolationist slumber. Now, when it came to World War II, we are going to be in it. After Pearl Harbor, Hitler honored a pact with Japan and declared war on the United States. The debate over isolationism in the United States were over. World War II was now a true world war, and the United States was fully involved.